So welcome to this uh, business and strategy session. Um, we're going to introduce a, um, an enterprise solution that we built using Drupal. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself. Um, my name is PK. I'm from uh, Manchester. So um, I'm the CEO of LiveLink, which is a Drupal shop. Um, and predominantly, we're um, a kind of marketing agency with a focus on technology and delivering kind of marketing solutions and marketing automation solutions. We use, uh, mainly use Drupal, Drupal Commerce, Copernica, which is a marketing automation engine, and Bithide, which is an analytics uh, engine. Uh, because we, we figure that data is, is important, uh, not just to deliver uh, the right kind of solution, but also ongoing marketing, uh, kind of relevant, timely marketing, uh, you need the right kind of data. <coughs> I'm going to introduce Ed. Hi, I'm uh, Ed Abbas. I'm the head of Man United Soccer Schools. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview um, in terms of who we are, what we do, and why we've done this project. So we're the international grassroots football division of, of Manchester United, the, the commercial arm. There are um, four pillars to that, the, the academy, um, the foundation, the charitable arm, Center of Excellence, and then what we do around the world. Um, we predominantly deliver to, to children ages 8 to 18, but we've delivered to children who are younger and to people up to 80 years of age, but we have been gentle whenever we've done that. Um, we are what we call a, an authentic experience. And when I say that, I mean that what we deliver on the field to children of all abilities is essentially the same training practices that the Manchester United First Team and Academy employ every day. But we do it in a way that the, the children are able to take part, but that they, they feel like every much the pro as a, as, as a first team player might. Um, I'm actually employed by Nike. Nike run Manchester United Soccer Schools as part of the wider long term merchandising agreement. And Nike uses Manchester United Soccer Schools to promote the, the Manchester United brand um, around the world. Um, as you said, we reach thousands of children um, in every part of the world. Um, and our programs, uh, generally speaking, operated with expert partners in different territories. We have a relatively small team uh, back in Manchester. We do all of the strategy, the, the curriculum, um, and, and quality control to make sure it's delivered in the right manner. All of the coaching is done with our own coaches, uh, generally sent from Manchester, who work for us all over the world. But these partners, these expert partners in each territory, allow us to bring a scalability that our small team on our own wouldn't be able to deliver. Um, but what we have identified is, um, with that small team, that clearly digital is a massive opportunity for us to, to uh, we reach far and wide. And in LiveLink, we found a, a company that were, uh, were very much like-minded in, in the strategies that we were trying to pursue. Um, we created this project in order to ensure that we had consistency against all of the different operations we have around the world, and hopefully then harness some synergies for everyone's benefit. Um, we have about 10 partners around the world in, in various locations, which I'll come into in a second. And when we went into this, um, they had each one of those operated a standalone website with some had e-commerce engines, some didn't have e-commerce engines, and tended to operate to a certain degree in isolation. Um, we came in and we said, well, look, you know, that's not going to benefit everyone. We need to bring all of this together. So we started off with our main um, MUSS hub, the main site, and then gra gradually now we're rolling out partner mini sites. So to give a sense of where we operate, um, we have full-time operations in India, China, Singapore, uh, and in the Middle East. And then we have seasonal uh, camps as well in places like um, Scandinavia, Italy, and Japan. All of these partners all have different goals, all have different needs, but what we've tried to do is, is, is be a support for them centrally. So just to give you a bit of an idea of the project description or the impossible task that, um, that we gave PK and LiveLink, um, we came to where we said we wanted to create a consistent digital presence to, to elevate the brand of Manchester United Soccer Schools. It needs to have a central um, e-commerce engine, but that central e-commerce engine needs to be able to then roll out to each individual partner site with individual products. 
Um, that would help us hopefully to drive standardisation across reporting because we would have got different types of reports from different projects. Hopefully with this we'll have one single view centrally. Um, we had three global sites that we needed to merge together because it made no sense to fragment the traffic as we had it previously. Um, but what we want to do, as we said earlier, is enable the partners to sell unique products in each of their local markets. Dependent on cultural differences, the needs of the footballs in those countries, we have different products, so we need to make sure we can represent that as part of this project. And by doing this, by having this consistency and this, this central hub, and hopefully my team central in Manchester could increase marketing collaboration and support for those partners, so hopefully everyone gets more out of it. So in terms of the requirements, just to keep it simple, we need to be multi-site, multi-region, multilingual. Not, not, not a difficult request really. It needs to be B2B and B2C, e-commerce based. Multiple checkouts using multiple currencies. Responsive theme, because obviously everyone's using mobiles now. And with marketing automation features. Oh yeah, and with the content pollution workflow as well. All of that hopefully drafts a fantastic reporting suite for us so I can say that we're great and all of our partners are doing a fantastic job for us. So I'm going to hand to PK now to explain how he made sense of everything that we wanted. Actually, mainly we didn't. Oh, well, we, we, we kind of did. So we, uh, we started off with, uh, with a base uh, Drupal Commerce uh, module, or a set of modules, and we kind of before we embarked on, on developing this project or delivering this project, we, we, we know commerce really well and we've done many, many projects using commerce. So Drupal commerce became kind of a de facto default solution because as we understood the project uh, and its requirements, it became obvious that we needed a really flexible checkout system and, and Drupal Commerce does that really well with, with extra panes. Um, we needed to validate forms as they were being filled. I'm going to, through the slides, I'm going to show you that there are multiple ste steps to check out and there's a lot of information gathering during that process before the checkout and after the checkout. So Drupal Commerce is quite strong at doing that. We also used views um, extensively. Um, and I'll cover some of that a bit later. And also the ability to handle uh, many payment types. So uh, that was also kind of a strong part of what Drupal Commerce can deliver. The other idea, uh, the other key things were kind of using the Ent Entity API and the Field API because of the nature of multi-steps and multiple kind of data sets we, we required. Um, views huge number of reports, very custom, um, and because Views uses uh, fields um, with custom entities, and especially because we're storing player details. So the main kind of thing was broken down into eight steps um, during the project planning stage, and the requirements were as um, that kind of um, created vaguely set out. So we then uh, kind of proceeded on to the next step, which was to actually designing the user journeys. So that was the kind of first step. So understand broadly what the client wants, and then we tried to make sense of it by actually planning out the journeys, uh, typical user journeys. And invariably, you know, a, a, a visitor would, would end up uh, coming to the site, viewing a camp or a course, um, add something to the basket. Um, check out, and then along that process, there were a lot of details being captured. So I'm gonna detail out some of those a little bit later. And then the key, key thing about this project was in the way Drupal uh, comms was used, which is once you create an order in Drupal, it invariably cannot be modified, but the system actually that Manchester United required was that the order could be modified afterwards. Okay? so a number of things can be done with the order afterwards. So this was quite unique, or we believe it's unique. So the first step was to optimizing the checkout. So the first step invariably is fairly standard these days where you uh, capture just an email address 
because that then enables you, if the cart is abandoned, because of the complex nature of the forms, form filling that's required, uh, all that information usually is not available uh, at hand by the user, so they may abandon the basket at some point in the, in the process. So we made sure that uh, just capturing email address give, gave us the ability to, to then communicate with them automatically. So I'll cover a bit of that a little bit later. And once you completed your booking, you then could come back and view your orders and actually the system would tell you what sort of things you haven't done and what sort of things you need to do or what sort of things you need to book uh, more on top of that initial order. So the same order gets modified multiple times. So the, the, the first thing we addressed was what data were we looking to capture? So in, in this case, uh, we were looking to capture parents' details or guardians' details, child's details, and normally name, age, gender, and medical details. Now, some of this data is actually used to validate whether they are appropriate for that particular camp. So, like, age is used in that way. Um, also, the details of the person transacting, which may, may not necessarily be the parent or the guardian. So, it, again, it's a third party. Um, also, the ability to actually have multiple product types uh, so we were selling courses, camps, airport transfers, weekend stays, visa support letters, because a lot of the kids come from all over the world and they may require visas to enter the United Kingdom, uh, and also multiple payment methods. So editing an order multiple times was a, was a big challenge. Um, are you guys familiar with commerce and the way it works? No? Okay. Well, it can do this. Okay. It's a huge amount of customization, but it can do it. The other complication that was added was the ability, because of the value of the order, it, these are high value products. So typically a top end uh, course is over 2,000 pounds. Yeah, we have some courses that are 800 pounds, you know, 2,300 pounds. So it's difficult for people to, to essentially pay all that all in one go. So we need to give them the opportunity to pay over a period of time. So initially, just to get the booking, they can, uh, they can uh, take a, a part payment uh, and check out. And then they can come back and pay off the balances. But not only that, they can also come back and purchase extras. Uh, and there are many types of extras that they can do. The other big thing was also the ability to actually check out without paying anything at all. Now you might think that's a bit crazy, right? Uh, <laughs> but actually it works because it, it allows people to just go through the checkout and then they've got, they know they can come back and, and pay. And they can pay with the and pay with the bank transfers or credit cards and such. Um, also, the admin staff can also, when they receive bank transfers, they can apply the payments on behalf of the customer. Okay, so they can do that manually. Um, the, the big aspect of the system was the ability to order extras. Um, these are all kind of upsells and cross-sell, not cross-sell, per sell, but upsell. So these are extras to the, the camp itself. And, so things like airport transfers, weekend stays, match day tickets, and soccer kits. So these are all things we can sell afterwards, and they can be attached to the original order. The reference number is the same, always. <coughs> so just uh, to, to kind of recap, so we require one global site, many partner sites. The site database uh, shares users' orders and content. Okay, so it was a very kind of integrated system. Um, each site or a partner site has a unique set of products. So we used um, a number of, I mean, these are two kind of key modules we used. We used probably 50, 60 different modules, and some custom modules are also developed for this system. But domain access, um, I don't know, are you familiar with domain access module? Yeah? So that was used, used to control permissions because what we wanted was a system where Global admin role could go and edit any site, whereas localized admin could only control and modify and manage the local sites. We also used uh, the Workbook module. Um, I think some guys will be familiar with that also. Um, also to control the, 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 the content workflow as to how content could be published locally, let's say in India, and it could either be then be pushed into the global site uh, or vice versa. <clears throat> the, the other big requirement which Ed hasn't touched on was apart from the B2C element of the system, um, 
we also needed a B2B system because apart from being able to sell local um, con uh, lo local uh, camps, we also have field agents, sales field agents. So we have sales agents around the world, which could be, they could be estate agents, sorry, estate agents, um, not estate agents, um, travel agents, they could be especially sports tour agents, and they also then sell in whichever territory they're an expert to, for group bookings. Now, it's beneficial to them because they might organize the travel, um, the, the airport transfers themselves, so it's a business for them, but it's great for us because then we maybe get, rather than one individual booking, we'll get 20 or 30 coming as a group, and we also know that they'll have a group leader, so it takes a lot of the pain away than managing that group that are coming over to the UK for us. So okay. we forgot to mention this at the early stage of the project that we needed this as well. So, so this was kind of another uh, mini application within the application itself, where uh, an agent could come along and, and actually make uh, block bookings uh, and then fill out player details uh, by uploading a CSV file. Um, the, the agents also had slightly different payment options. Um, their roles would also signify what, the, what commissions they received. Um, they also could generate invoices for each booking that they made, either as whole booking or as part booking for each child, so that they could supply invoicing direct to the, to, to the parents. Um, also, uh, we used um, another key module we used was the uh, Drupal message module, uh, which was used, which automatically generates emails to, to chase up payments or unpaid payments. Um, for administration, uh, menus were kind of customized. We used workflow um, using Workbench. Um, also, the admin role allowed um, orders to be amended by, by admin staff. And the other kind of nifty little feature, which, which is standard Drupal, is to ability to log changes. Every time you touched an order and did something on it, it would create a log with the order. So when you viewed it underneath, there's a log of all the activity that is automatically generated by the system. So that becomes very useful. Um, and also, if somebody were to cancel an order, again, it can be handled automatically with an email that is sent to the customer. Um, the reporting engine was developed. Um, there are many, many reports that were specified. I think originally there were about 25 different reports, which were kind of boiled down into 10 key reports, which did the role of 25 uh, different reports. So you could, for example, um, Abandoned basket was a kind of key feature. Uh, how to manage abandoned uh, carts was a key feature requirement uh, up front. So there was a, there's a report that uh, we use with great uh, views that allowed the admin staff to actually come and use that as a lead generation tool, either then and afterwards. So the system itself would manage the abandoned carts. So there are time delayed emails. I'm gonna show you a diagram later on, quite complicated, which does that process, and there are many, many other things that, that the admin can draw, the information they can draw, uh, because some of it is operational, some of it's for sales, some is for marketing. Uh, for, for example, for operational reports, um, we have kind of um, uh, an insurance report, for example. So this report would specify, because this is required by the insurance company, would list children and group them in age groups for the purpose of insurance, make sure they're insured while they're in, in in the care, in the MESS care. For marketing, um, we, we developed a multi-step, uh, many, many multi-step emails, which would generate depending on where you were in the checkout, or if you had already checked out, or if you had bought an extra, and so on and so on. And there are many, 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 many of these. I'm gonna show you a, a great example of one of those. And if you're not using that, you should use uh, the message module, because it's a fantastic configurable module for exactly this kind of purpose. Also, um, all the data that we were collecting about transactions, users, and so on, was also being pushed into uh, the Copernica Marketing Automation Engine, which was then, which is then used now to actually automate a lot of the other marketing outside of the transactions. Um, we are also now uh, in, the, in the kind of second phase of this project where we're actually helping MESS with email marketing, social media, search and display, remarketing, and landing pages based on what we call kind of optimizing 
pages as you go along. So you look at the performance of various key pages, and if they're not quite right, we experiment and we optimize and create landing pages. Um, we're also going to be introducing uh, website tracking, which is more akin to uh, scoring people as they land. You create a profile and you score them based on their journey uh, uh, during their visits, either single or multiple visits. And when, when you know who they are, uh, when, they, when they kind of put something in the basket and they go through the checkout, you then attach all of the history, browsing history of the site to their profile. So that then gives us an insight and then we're preparing for next season where we will then know what the typical journeys look like, what are the top 10 journeys, for example, and try and optimize them. So this is very much a kind of a business application that, that actually is optimized, or we want to optimize it to deliver maximum revenue. So this is a diagram I was going to show you. So this is typically if somebody's actually put a, um, a camp, book, or trying to book a camp and put them in a basket. So it's an EFL camp, which is English and football uh, language which is a specific uh, course that teaches football and also English language. Because a lot of the kids that come from, they come from Russia, China, and they're not very good with English, so they get taught soccer as well as English. So it's a, it's a great selling. Uh, so th this is a kind of automated messaging uh, example that we've, we've developed using the message module. And a little bit of customization. But essentially, it, it, it's a workflow as to you've paid, not paid. How much have you paid? Some of these emails are time delayed. So, you know, seven days later, what happens? 14 days later, what happens? Based on your previous sanction or inaction. And the ultimate goal is to get the, get the user through this time-based thing, get the payment, and prepare them to send their child to the camp. So it works really, really well. <clears throat> so Ed's going to uh, present what kind of impact we've had so far. So uh, as PK said, there's been a lot of work that's gone into this so far, and, and we haven't stopped yet. We're always looking to, to optimize whether it be the, the front end, the back end, the experience of the, the parents, the children who come on the camps. We thought we'd just give you a bit of an idea of, of, of what we've seen as successes so far, which, you know, for other bit us have been huge, really, and, and there were we were hoping that were the kind of things we get out of this project, but certainly um, ringing true. So we've seen visitor numbers go up 5% versus the same period last year. That might seem like a relatively small increase, but um, the external markets have not changed all that much. And we'd seen this through through word of mouth, through people that had used the website before that, that they were getting a better experience, so they're coming back to to use it. Our conversion rate, because it's such a high-value product, you, you know, we don't need to sell that many of them to actually um, drive the piece that we're driving, but we've, we've virtually doubled that conversion rate in the short space of time we've been running this project now, which obviously at this stage of the, of, of the sales process that we're in right now for the summer has, has had a huge impact. Um, we've also seen 5% of our revenue now coming from abandoned basket emails alone. That's something that we, we never had before. We had, we had no opportunity to do that. We didn't know if someone came on and, and, and abandoned, but well, that was it, they were gone. That was our last opportunity. Now, we have the automated emails that go out and give them different messages to hopefully get them to come back. But also, if the emails don't work, we have the details so we can contact them, we can phone them, we can email them personally. We can use all manner of ways to try and encourage them to, to come and purchase. And so that kind of, of jump in revenue for us is, is, has been huge. Um, Something that we probably, we had an idea of when we started, but probably didn't realize the benefits of it is just the, the streamline of the administration and, and hence the, the reducing of costs, not just for us centrally at our HQ, but also for all of our partners around the world. They, they all pay, um, uh, we, we, we centrally pay to invest in this, but all the partners pay a, a license fee to be part of this, which was a fraction of what they were paying before to run their own websites with... 10, 20 times more ability to do things than they've had before. Most of them never did, even did our e-commerce before, but now we're getting up to speed with that. Um, an 85 percent increase in revenues for mobile devices, which, I mean, anybody who's doing a building website with responsive things right now will know how important that is. That's, that, that's huge for us as well. And you know, we're finding more and more people now are, are using our website and, and, and purchasing, um, whether it be mobile or tablets, and it's something we're, we're trying to encourage more and more. But we made some mistakes as well. I'm going to let PK do the negative stuff now. I've done the positive stuff. <laughs> he leaves all the messy bits to me. 
things. <laughs> so there were, uh, along the way, we made um, some assumptions that were probably incorrect. And during the discovery phase, we probably didn't, didn't discover enough. Um, we focused, actually, a lot of our focus initially was on user journeys and the flexibility that was required by the system. But there were a lot of, you know, they say the, the devil's in the detail, and it proved true. Uh, there were some aspects that we didn't discover until we were halfway through the project, and then we had to work, uh, rework some of the bits, which is quite typical for a complex project like this, because sometimes it's just not possible to discover everything. But we should try. Um, we didn't, um, you know, Drupal's, because the nature of Drupal is, is flexibility, uh, and there are many ways of doing the same thing, right? So we didn't probably didn't focus enough on, on how we store the data hung up because how are we going to ever use it? So if you start from what you need, you can then decide on how you're going to store stuff and how you're going to use it afterwards. So data structure was, was very important and the granularity of it was important. Um, we also, um, actually, towards the end of the project, we discovered that there were some aspects that were missing that we hadn't discovered. So part payment was one of them, which is a challenge in its own right. Somebody will tell you, if you've ever worked with group, uh, commerce, have you done part payments? It's a difficult one, okay? There isn't a ready-made module that does it, so we have to write one of our own. Um, and there were other aspects also, especially uh, taking part payments, um, bank deposits, and all those kind of stuff, you know, that, that were discovered fairly late on after the project had already been planned out. So those are the kind of things that I think discovery uh, is very important because sometimes the client will not tell you everything. If you've not asked the right questions, you don't discover it. And sometimes you just don't know to ask the right question. So more talking actually is very important. You know, to talk more, try and work things through a little bit more. Um, so, uh, next phase, what, what are we doing? So, we've already done um, three sites, I think. Uh, we're about to launch India. Has that been launched now? Yeah, so India is being launched. We launched Italy last month, uh, and we already launched the global site and the UK site. So, we're kind of launching one partner site per month, but I think we're going to accelerate that. So, I think within the next three months, the, 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 this phase of the project will be complete. Um, we're also implementing a content strategy to try and get more traffic to the site. Um, and then, this is an ongoing process. Every three months, we look at the customer journeys and optimize some of them and try and hopefully improve the conversion, uh, conversion rates. And then the, the key thing is, Ed always wanted, it's like a, you know, a world domination type. Really bad and colorful dashboard that I give to management. <laughs> so, he, Ed wants some color and some graphics and all that to, to see, to actually deliver the metrics that he wants to keep an eye on, uh, but delivered in a, in a graphical format. So we're also building him uh, dashboards, and we have an application that has been built um, by LiveLink, and it's called BitLive. Go and check it out. It's got B-I-T-H-I-I-V-E.com. So um, I think it kind of, I hope it's been useful for you guys. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll take a few questions. I think we've got plenty of time. Sure. No technical questions for me, please. <laughs> uh, neither of us are uh, technical. I'm at the business end of the, of the, of the organization, so. Right. Um, well, first, I'm born and raised an Evertonian, so uh, treat David well. When he uh, head of internationals in Evertonian, so you're in safe <laughs> company. Yeah, okay, good. Well, treat, treat Mr. Moyes well. He's been really good for us. Um, yeah, well, okay. So talking about your, your timed message releases, um, was that all managed completely by that uh, the message module um, that you talked about, and was Drupal what managed your actual email going out? Yes. You know? Yes. So all the transactional emails and abandoned emails uh, and payment, anything related to payment, and so everything that is that is generated within Drupal using the message module. And did you find much of a performance hit? Is, is Drupal the right tool to manage that? Well, I think those these are not high volume emails. Okay. So, you know, you're probably sending out maybe, uh, depending on, the, on your transaction levels, but maybe no more than 50, 100 emails per day. So it, it doesn't usually have a, a, a huge impact on your application. How you doing, guys? Uh, Hi. Just a question around the rollouts for your partner sites. What sort of strategy did you go with at the start, and why are you accelerating it from a month 
to more of a, a quicker rollout. Uh, I guess in terms of the, 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 the strategy for rollouts, it, it's been more on a, on a need basis, which partners needed it, it, it the soonest really, because some partners were already more ahead in the curve in terms of e-commerce, so we were comfortable with them keeping their websites in the short term until we, we got some of the, the ones that had more of a need. Um, Did you have a uh, sort of a training rollout strategy for the partner sites, I'm assuming because it's global? Yeah, we've had them over to Manchester. Um, Livelink have also prepared some video, video tutorials, documentation. You know, we, we have to hold their hand in the short term as well, so we'll do a bit of that for them from Manchester as well to help them through the process of, of, of using it as well. So it's, 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 it's not a fast process because we're, we're effective. These are more than websites. This is their business engine in a lot of ways, so it's, it's holding their hand for probably, you know, the rollouts, I guess, to a certain degree, not for PK, but... Um, for us, it's the easy bit, and then it's the, the making sure they're comfortable with it, and also making sure they get the most out of it as time goes by. Did you, have, with the documentation, did you have a, both an online and offline sort of experience, or did you build a, an online documentation tool? Uh, I mean, the main way we deliver this is through um, through actually screen, screen capture, right. and, and then vo put a voiceover. So we do it more visually rather than um, actually Plenty of words. And we've done so screen takeover training as well, so obviously while they're sat at their computer maybe in India, we can, we, we've taken over their screen and shown them, you know, work, work, work them through the actual administration system as well so they can see how to use it. And uh, one more question. How are you guys going to manage, um, I guess, global uh, priorities or, you know, partner sites requesting features on the sites? Does it all go through one central management or can partner sites request new features that will roll out? Because I understand using domain access, which is one database, across multiple domains, but obviously all these partner sites want to have different feature requests because of the countries that they're in. Uh, actually, um, all the features are, are, um, are available in all, for all partner sites. So there is a degree of standardization here. We try and not customize each partner site to that kind of degree. The main thing that they, they can um, customize is content and products. But beyond that, no, the features are, are the feature set is decided centrally by HQ. What we have said to them is because we, we understand as well that most of them have maybe not got, at the moment, got the sophistication that, that we're trying to bring to this as well for them. But what we have said over time is once we're, once we're bedded in and all partners are up and running, then we'll try and look at it on a, on a three-month basis. Okay, what are the things that, that you would like? And everyone submit their, their ideas. Now, if there are things that, that is something that everyone needs, then we'll probably fund that centrally. If an individual partner wants to do something themselves and it's, it's going to be a massive drive for their business, then we'll let them fund it via LiveLink. So there will be potentially customizable things, but all the other sites, well, they need to invest in that if they want to do that. But mainly the features are then rolled out to all the sites. Yeah. yeah. Whether they use them or not, but, but they're available. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. 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 So all the reporting, is that all done in with views? Yes, most, yes, it is in fact, yes. Well, okay. Yes, it is possible. It really is. It requires a lot of work, but, but it, it is possible. Um, and also, we've also got the export features. So uh, when you create a, a view for something, we can also export the data. So you can just hit and it just does it. So, and also uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in views, you can add filtering. And, and, so there's a lot of flexibility in views. Um, and there are some advanced features within uh, within views that you can use to generate these reports. Um, I work with a nonprofit, and just like you, we uh, our core product is uh, relatively valuable. It's a child sponsorship, so it has a relatively high long-term value. Um, and so, just like you, we have a fairly low conversion rate for our uh, product. My question is, when you're looking at optimization. Have you been able to implement uh, live audience testing, A-B testing, or multivariate testing with a conversion rate like that, or have you used other methods of optimization? Uh, yes, um, we've already, in fact, um, in fact, within a couple of weeks, I think, yeah, yeah. within literally within a couple of weeks of uh, side going live, we noticed that there was a drop off uh, at a, during the journey um, because the camps were not visible where they should be. So we actually merged um, uh, a couple of steps into one into one step and kind of optimized that. So we constantly look to do split testing, 
constantly. So any key page during the journey or even as a landing page is optimized and tested. But this is an ongoing process. This never stops. Of course. Yeah. And PJ will tell you as well that I'm the biggest pain when it comes to those kind of things. I'm <laughs> constantly looking at the website every hour of the day thinking, how can I make that content better? Can we place that, that particular right. module uh, 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 about the camp in a better place that might be more visible? And, and it, it's not easy because obviously we are not necessarily that, that consumer and sometimes you only find out by moving it and doing it and then, and then you realize whether you made the right decision or the wrong decision. But as PK said, you know, in a fairly typical demanding nature that I am, within about two weeks we were already doing that and we don't really finish rolling out any of the sites. What tool are you using for that? Big what, what tool are you using for the testing? Is it oh, we use the Google um, Webmaster Tools. Oh, you use Webmaster Tools? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because again, there is no Drupal module that does that for you. I know. <laughs> and, 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 and I'll be honest with you, it's something that's been in the back of my head for a very long time. In fact, we last year developed, uh, we started to develop a, a, theming, a new theming engine for Drupal 7, uh, which kind of we finished. But one of the key features of this was the ability to actually create pages on the fly which to do the A-B split tests. But we kind of shelved that because the amount of energy that was required to keep it up to date and, and, and produce a responsive element, it just became a bit too much in terms of, it was a resource hungry beast. So we, we killed it, basically. No, it's, it's a difficult I, challenge. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, go for it. Not a difficult one, please. Uh, <laughs> it's a long day. Sort of, sort of technical, but um, <laughs> with your, your your partner's sites, do they have responsibility? Because you're using a domain access and you're giving them certain rights. Do they have responsibility or, I guess, when it comes to asset management or uh, images and all that sort of stuff? How did you guys look at sharing content and images across the partner sites? Or is it okay, so like image libraries and so on, they're, they are shared. So there is a central repository for uh, assets that you need. Uh, content can then just be created uh, on a per domain basis and then you may decide. You may have the role uh, that says you can publish this elsewhere apart from your own uh, local site. So invariably, um, you know, if there's a piece of news or something which is of interest globally, that can be pushed into HQ where uh, a content manager would then decide whether to publish it or not. So they may just tweak it and then publish it globally. So the Indian partner could put the content on their site and make offer it up to us, but we'll have to say, yes, that's okay, we'll put that on the global site as well. Yeah. And how did you go about when it comes to SEO, sharing that content from a global site to, or from the partner site to the global site? Did you just have like sort of canonical link? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So it goes both ways, so you can, you can um, whoever decides Whoever's actually publishing the content or creating the content can decide where it might be of use. And even uh, you may you may find that uh, when they publish content globally, um, um, the Indian ma market manager may decide that that story of interest to, to India, and they can pull that story and actually publish it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, lads. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, thank you for attending this session. I hope you found it useful. And uh, if you need any more information, well, you can uh, actually forgot to put my email and stuff. So, <laughs> so anyway, if you want to write it down, it's uh, pk at ltl .uk .com, or come and see us at livelinknewmedia.com. Thank you. Thank you.